Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode four of Justin and the Food Entrepreneurs. I have with me today Deborah Micus, my co host, my significant other, and business partner. Say hello, Deborah. Hello. And today we are with Tommy from Boot Liquor. He does hot sauces and beef jerkies. Tommy, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about your product? Sure thing. Um, my name is Tommy Wood. I'm from the metro Atlanta area. I've, uh, I grew up the son of an entrepreneur, so I kind of get that honest. I uh, didn't actually mean to be in the food business, but in the early 2000s, I was playing in a band and we were eating a lot of wings. And uh, kind of on a whim, I said, I'm going to make my own hot sauce. And I did. And everybody loved it. A few years later, people started pressuring me to bring it to market. So uh, <laughs> with the way I grew up, you know, it's like the son of an entrepreneur. It's like if I'm in the business, I'm going to be all in. So, of course, that one thing led to another. And we started developing other products. And once we figured out how to bring boot liquor to market, um, that led to other things, which we are working on now with the jerky and the second sauce and uh, as well as the other things that we have sort of coming down the pipeline. So how would you describe your, your sauce? Well, boot liquor is a cayenne Louisiana style sauce. What elevates it to a more gourmet um, flavor profile is the garlic, the pickled jalapeno and the tequila. Tequila is something that, you know, I didn't really have any, I'm not a chef, so I didn't really have any instinct. Well, I guess it was instinct um, that that told me that would be good in hot sauce. So I tried it, uh, worked on a very basic recipe that really worked, and we have changed it very little since that very first recipe. Um, and so, like I said, that's what elevates that to, it gives it this unique kind of tang or twist uh, above uh, other things, you know, like a Texas Pete or Frank's, you know, that kind of run of the mill grocery store, but still good sauce. Boot liquor takes that up to another level. So what all do people use your sauce for? It started as a wing sauce, like, you know, you would think. And so some usual suspects got, you know, integrated like eggs, pizza and burgers. But we started making like a boot liquor wrap at home. Even my kids liked it. It wasn't too hot for them. Uh, that's one thing that we tell people we're not about, we're not a dare sauce. So we're not like this ghost pepper on 11 kind of sauce. Uh, we are all about a good balance of flavor and heat. So we're a four out of 10 on the Scoville chart. Um, we even marinate steak in it, which is an interesting story. I was always, I always thought about it, but I was a little bit afraid to ruin a steak because I wouldn't put steak in Texas Pete, for example. Um, but my friend called me one day, he's one of my biggest fans. And he said, uh, have you ever tried marinating steak in it? And I said, well, I've always been afraid to ruin the steak. And he said, do it. Trust me, it's awesome. So I did, and it, and he was right. So it's very versatile sauce. Um, and I, we're finding that the new sauce, which is a whiskey-based, it's a similar recipe, but whiskey-based, a little bit tangier, and it feels like it has a little less heat. Um, you know, we're finding it's, it's pretty versatile as well, and a lot of guys are are really digging the new sauce. So for our audience, could you explain to them the scale for hot sauce and, and how it works? And, and again, repeat where your hot sauces sort of fall on that scale. Yeah, um, I'm not an expert on the scale, but the Scoville chart is sort of a one to 10. I mean, it, it's actually more complicated than that, but ours comes in at a four out of 10 on that as far as the heat. Um, we, and 10 being the hottest. Right. That's why I said, you know, some people go for that dare sauce. It's like on 11, you know, <laughs> um, but, you know, and I've, and I, we've actually gotten c kind of some pushback from that at like outdoor festivals. People come up like, how hot is it? You know? And I'm like, well, it's not intended to be a dare sauce. So it, it's not that kind of thing. Um, so in hot sauce competitions, sometimes, you know, us guys that don't have that extreme heat are kind of looked at as like, you know, why are you here? <laughs> No, no, I've had one of those dare sauces before, and I was rolling around in my parents' yard, crying, mouth-watering, just trying to get the burning to stop. Uh, I was one of those experiences where there, you want to try it, but it's just not enjoyable because you can't taste anything for about two days. So, I think and that's just. What I, I've read some articles about this, and you know, they say there is just that point it gets to where the flavor's gone, and and so what's the point, you know? If, 
you know, if you're like me and it's, it's all about enhancing your food as opposed to, you know, erasing it. <laughs> well, it sounds like that's what your friend was suggesting with the steak and marinating it and your yeah. original fear of it over, you know, well, not even over the not steak. Even, not even. Yeah, not even overpowering it as much as just being the wrong kind of thing to put on a steak. You know, like I said, I wouldn't have ever thought put steak in a cayenne sauce as a marinade and then also use it as a dipping sauce uh, on the plate. But that's what we did with bootlicker and it was awesome. So at this point, how long have you guys been in business? The original sauce has been on the market for three years. Uh, coming up this next month will be our third anniversary in February. Uh, we've been making it since 02, and we would make 12 or 24 bottles a year and just give it out as gifts, Christmas, things like that, friends that would harass us because they wanted more. Um, so it was, I mean, all along the past few, you know, decade, we tried to bring it to market a couple of times, and we just couldn't figure out because we weren't, food people, like food business industry people. So we couldn't figure out how do you get over these hurdles? For example, the alcohol content. And so that's something that our co-packer helped us understand uh, how to get through those regulations and things like that. Um, so, but yeah, the sauce has been on the market for three years. And then the new sauce, the bootlicker Jack has been around for two months. And so not being in the food industry, I know there's a lot of people in the audience, they, uh, they're they not quite food entrepreneurs, but they have a family recipe and, and your experience sounds similar. How did you navigate those waters with, with not knowing what to do? Were there people you relied on or was it something you sort of just worked your way through and and what were some of those hardships? Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of Googling, you know, to understand uh, what you're, what you're going to need to do. But I think, you know, similar to when I was in college and you have a professor like in computer lab over your shoulder uh, showing you how to do something so you don't have to read the manual, uh, that's a little easier, that hands-on apprenticeship type thing. So when you find the right person, uh, like I did with this co-packer who understood, you know, instantly these two things that, that I couldn't get my head around, um, you know, key people, you know, are key uh, in helping you get, you get over those things. I think with our sauce, you know, being an acid food, we had uh, a slightly easier path than some people might, you know, we weren't putting fresh peaches in, in the sauce, for example, and that would have been a different, uh, a different kind of process, you know, and regulation. So, um, I, I'm not familiar. I, we don't, currently where we in the food world we are and we don't currently deal with alcohol at all so what does that look like i mean does it matter when it goes onto a shelf or is there different regulation or or do you have to track it differently i'm assuming there's not enough alcohol in it to actually get drunk but um right. is there regulation there you would get you would get sick drinking hot sauce before you got sick being drunk trying to drink, <laughs> drink enough food liquor to get to get a buzz um but what we had to do is call the, uh, the Georgia Department of Agriculture, and I believe we talked to the ATF as well. And what it comes down to is that it's not an alcohol food, so it doesn't fall necessarily under their jurisdiction. You just have to make sure that the, like you said, the ratio of alcohol to product is not uh, more than it can be, so, so that it doesn't become an alcohol product. And in our second sauce, for example, um, you know, we hit a different regulation where they required us to heat the alcohol before it goes into the mix. And our first sauce, they didn't require that same thing. So just really kind of case by case, but the, the, the simple answer to your question is that it, it's all about that ratio. Like you were talking about, it's, um, there's not enough alcohol in it to warrant it being regulated. How did you come up with the name bootlicker? Is it something from the the band you were playing in or where it started or where did that whole idea come up, come from? You know, people ask me that a lot and I tell them the domain was available. Yeah, and, I, and of course I'm kidding. Um, really, I think it came from uh, just sitting around thinking about bringing it to market. And I thought, you know, I want to I give this thing a, an identity that 
that is unique. And, um, and I started thinking about, you know, we wanted to have this old West saloon style vibe, you know, something that looks like it's on the back bar of an 1875 saloon. Um, and so little things kind of just popped in my mind, things like boots, uh, the liquor content, you know, being that has a, a tequila in the one and whiskey in the other. Of course, at the time we just had the one flavor, um, you know, so, and then it made me think of pot liquor, which if you're from the South, which I don't know what you are, but I am. And my mother grew up, you know, eating the stuff called pot liquor, which was like, like hot sauce, like a, like a pepper sauce, like that clear pepper sauce on a, uh, like was black eyed peas and cornbread and that kind of thing. And, uh, so yeah, I would never eat it, but she did. Um, so these things just sort of became an amalgamation of ideas in my mind, I think, and boot liquor, you know, just kind of hit me and you know, the boot, the liquor and pot liquor and this kind of idea. Um, it really had nothing to do with sort of the idea of boot licking. Like you think of, you know, someone brown nosing or, you know, being at someone their heels of their superior or whatever that really wasn't on my mind. Uh, so make sure that when you search our socks, you spell it right with two K's. Um, yeah. For it, sure. So on um, that note, where do people find your product? What's your website, uh, Instagram, stuff like that. Um, and then I, I have a question. I want you also to describe your bottle and, and sort of the shape of it and, and how that all works. Cause I, I remember it being pretty unique in, yeah. in, in your theory behind it. So, um, if we well, could cover that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, and I was going to say also about the name when I when the when I finally put the name Bootlicker together in my mind, I went to my uh, web host and checked to see if it was available, and it was. I locked it in, and we never looked back. Um, originally, the the sauce was called Saucy Jack, which was an homage to the Spinal Tap movie. I won't go into all that right now, but <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, so you talked about the bottle, and what else was your question? Um, just uh, where people can get your product now and your oh, website right. and, and the audience so they can see the, the products as they're uh, watching or listening to the podcast. Yeah, it's pretty easy to find because of the unique spelling, you know, boot and then L-I-K-K-E-R, uh, whether it be Instagram, Twitter, or uh, Facebook, uh, that's pretty much our handle, Bootlicker. Um, and then bootlicker.com is our website. You can buy it there. Uh, sometimes it's good to buy it there in the bulk quantities. That way you, you know, save a little bit on shipping. If you want it, you know, if you're a prime member, you can get it on Amazon uh, and save on shipping there. Um, it's currently sold out on Amazon, but it will be restocked soon. Um, let's see. And then the bottle itself, um, you know, we've, we've been uh, chastised here and there, mostly by the manufacturing side to be like, why don't you do a round bottle? It'd be so much easier to label, you know, things like that. But, um, in, in going forward, this idea of, of the, the alcohol content, um, which, you know, we're not, we're not out there trying to promote the alcohol content. It's just sort of, it's just part of, of the sauce. It's part of the flavor profile. Uh, but having that in there and having that old West kind of vibe to it, we wanted to go with a flask and, and the idea that a flask could actually be tucked inside a boot, you know, for emergency hot sauce, maybe if you needed it. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, so at some point we might do some other, varieties of bottles just you know like we're, right now we're talking about doing a plastic flask for the military uh we've got a few military guys that are out there wanting the sauce in, you know out there on the battlefield kind of thing at, in their rucksack you know and they can't take care of the glass so we're looking at doing a custom bottle for those guys i can see a lot of uh women carrying some boot liquor in their boots for their bloody marys actually there you go i like it So, um, I know you did the flavor of Georgia, um, a couple years ago and, um, it's where I've met you when I was a judge yeah. there. So do, do you find that contests like that and, um, and other things that the state of Georgia is doing to promote food business is, is beneficial to you? And, and what are your experiences with those? I think it is good. The flavor of Georgia is definitely the most, um, uh, sort of high profile thing that we qualified for that we were a finalist in. Uh, I think that the contacts we got there were that were really beneficial were more in the industry as opposed to say end user. Uh, but that's been great as well. Um, and, and definitely when like we were just did the America's Mart for the first time, there were people there buying and they would, they saw the flavor of Georgia seal on our label and that meant something to them, which was great. 
Other contests for us have been a little hit and miss. I mean, we're waiting right now to find out if we want anything uh, for, uh, I think it's called the Hot Pepper Awards. Uh, we came in second place in our division in the Flav Awards uh, in, in 18. Um, and then we won this thing called the Man Cave Award. So, it, you know, it's, it's fun to win. Um, it hasn't, you know, done a whole lot for necessarily sales. What, one thing that did a lot for us was getting written up in Georgia Magazine as the top 15 Georgia gifts to give, you know, at Christmas this past year. And that sold us out on Amazon within a couple of days. Wow, that's great. What other marketing ventures have you guys gone in and what have been your successes and what are the ones that didn't work out so well? Um, as far as, as far as marketing bootlicker? Yes. Um, well, we, we, we just got written up in this magazine called spotlight on business and they really promoted it. We didn't have to do anything, but, you know, it's basically just give the interview. Um, but when it was released, uh, sort of, uh, on the opposite side of the, how the Georgia magazine was very effective for us, we didn't see anything from that one, you know, so it was interesting to see the difference in two different publications one having an impact, one having zero impact. Um, trying to think what else, you know, we, I find, I mean, I've, I've been in uh, design and advertising for a while because that's part of what I do to make, you know, to make a living. And I found that for me, like uh, printed advertising is not really working. You know, everything's going, you know, has gone such, you know, as far as like Facebook ads and, and Amazon ads and that kind of thing. Uh, we have seen some effective uh, sales through Amazon ads, um, but not through Facebook ads. So that's another interesting, you know, two sides to the similar coin, you know. Um, and then the other thing I was going to mention about promotional, we're working on a video now, which we are looking for a runway. So if anybody knows of a runway, let us know. Um, An uh, airplane we're, we're runway? For, uh, like, like a fashion runway. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're, um, we're, we're hoping to find one. We wouldn't have to build one, you know, we wouldn't have to rent one. We're hoping to find one that's already set up, but we're, I don't want to blow all the uh, mystery of this ad, but it's going to be a really hilarious ad that we hope will go viral all about uh, bootlicker and, and it, it being essentially like, you know, the hot look of the season. Yeah. Once that goes live, we'll definitely repost it through our channels as well to help you out there. And um, any, any way we can help, that's why we're, why we're doing the podcast is try to get, everyone out there and help food entrepreneurs and, and learn from each other. Yeah. Um, so it, that being said, are, are you, how have you sort of managed these relationships is most of it come online then from Amazon or is it stores and you have to manage the relationships with the, the, uh, general stores or the supermarkets. Most of what we have to manage on a sort of person to person basis is, is the stores that sell us. Uh, Amazon handles, you know, when we're doing just the one or two bottles online to an end user, they're handling all that, you know, even if there's a breakage, things like that, we really don't even have to touch that. Uh, we still do have a few orders on our website. And so in that case, we have some direct contact with that end user. Um, but mostly we're selling uh, outside of that, we're selling to places like the Salt Table in Savannah, you know, where they, they stock it both in their airport store, their downtown historic district store, and their outlet center store. Um, and it's, you know, we have several locations like that that carry us. And what we need, we need 100 or 200 locations like that that carry us. That's where we need to be going forward. So is that your target market, looking at clients like that? I think right now that's, uh, I think that's a logical step to increase where we are. Um, you know, we have talked to, uh, we've actually just submitted product to a large uh, chain grocery store for their locals division to see if they would place us there. We actually had a deal with a large organic food store. And then we found out that there was a, a preservative in our original sauce that they, that they couldn't allow. Uh, but our new sauce is completely clean. So we're going to be going back to them with that one. Um, so, you know, we're, we're just kind of trying to take it slow and organically to allow the, the mom and pops and the gourmet stores to help us build the foundation for going, go, going bigger. Um, you know, we're not trying to go too big, too fast. We enjoy the direct to, 
to a person to person thing when we go and do an outdoor festival to to get people really excited about our brand and to and to see their you know them saying to you this is what tabasco was trying to do you know or this is the best hot sauce i've ever had you know that kind of stuff is great too to have that uh, in-person feedback you know it's amazing how the hot sauce industry uh in the united states has has grown and started so much room for for entrepreneurs, I was in a hot sauce store in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, a while back, and it was—I mean, layers upon layers of, of shelving of hot sauces from from all over the United States. I mean, it was amazing, and and sampling yeah. them. So I feel that there's stores like that are starting to pop up. I believe I saw another one. I just can't remember what city, but it seems like people are really starting to get a, a taste for it in a variety. I know Deborah and I in our own fridge have a whole shelf dedicated to hot sauce. Well, we, and, and as, even if it's not a dedicated store, we have a store that, that carries us in Bogart, Georgia, near Athens, and they probably have 40 feet of hot sauce on the shelves. And fortunately, we sell off curb appeal alone there because, you know, we're not there every, every weekend doing a taste test kind of thing or sampling it. Um, but it, you know, on the one hand, yeah, it's great that it sort of opened up, you know, everything from the internet and, and just sort of people's ingenuity opening this up wider, but you know, there's a lot more competition, um, of course as well. And one thing I was going to mention about you, you saying about the hot sauce stores, we recently got contacted by this guy who is trying to catalog every hot sauce that's out there. So we sent him a bottle and he's developed this kind of like, um, registrar or a registry of hot sauces and so he has a bottle of every one of them in his collection and uh, i can't tell you the website for that right now because i don't remember but i thought it was pretty cool you know that he was cataloging this for for the industry now that's an amazing idea i like that a lot actually i you could see every hot sauce there is i'd be mm -hmm. i'd be interested to see how many there are it's like vineyards and 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 now microbreweries there's so many you just it's hard to keep track of all of them well, one thing we don't want to be is just what a gift shop sauce. You know, we're, we're not trying to be one of these that just has a funny label or a funny name or something to get people to buy it on, on a compulsory thing. We really want to be a staple in people's pantry. Uh, it's a staple in our pantry. It's a staple in a lot of our, our local fans and family here. And, uh, that's, that's our goal is, is that it not just be like a gift sauce. And so do you go out and do all the sales then and, and do the introductions and, and, and get into these mom and pop shops uh, around Georgia and the surrounding areas? And are you expanding outside of Georgia with that as well? Yeah, so far it's been me knocking on doors, making phone calls, emails, uh, a little word of mouth. Um, you know, one of our biggest successes was going and doing an outdoor festival in North Georgia, where we not only kind of flooded the market with about 50 bottles of hot sauce, the people that bought it that day, but four stores in about that 20 mile radius picked us up. So now there's this sort of like North Georgia fan base and retailers that are supporting it. So that was a cool little thing that happened. Um, but we are starting, you know, the America's Mart uh, helped us really get outside the borders of Georgia we just did that uh, two weeks ago. We were already in Tennessee and South Carolina, but even though we tried to make some inroads into Florida and things, we just hadn't really found uh, footing yet. But now we'll be in Virginia, Utah, California, uh, Mississippi. We're starting to, to spread. Oh, that's awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about the America's Mart? I've seen social media for quite a bit of food entrepreneurs that were there as well as other entrepreneurs. Um, and just, uh, I'm curious, because I've only seen photos, but could you describe a little bit what that was like and, and what they do there? Yeah, the January show has a real, um, I mean, it's a huge show, but they have a focused floor on gourmet foods uh, in that show in particular. And, and they may do it in July or whenever the next show is as well, but it's once or twice a year they really allow the, the gourmet food people to come in and, and promote. And what we did is we went and were a part of the Georgia Grown pavilion they call it which is several georgia grown products you can do that for i believe two years to kind of get your feet wet in the show um and it was it was really good i mean it was uh we we know we have leads that will turn into future sales we did pretty good um on the floor um as it was but we're excited about you know everyone that we met there and the potential you know, to grow into those new locations as well 
I've been at trade shows both as vendors and buyers. Uh, they're all similar in ways and different, of course, in their own ways. But um, we we found that you know it, it it makes for long days. You know, it's like nine to six, and it feels it feels longer than it sounds. Um, but it was a really good experience. Um, it helped us being our first time at a direct to store trade show helped us to see how to do it better next time, even though I thought we did a pretty good job of, of having the right kind of display and having the right kind of approach to talking to people about the product. Yeah, I find that at the trade shows, it's a, you learn so much the first couple you do, but it's the gap between them that it takes so long to then take that knowledge and, and, and education you just got through a fire hose and, and reapply it. Yeah. But if you yeah. can, and some products don't do as well at trade shows as others, um, it all depends. I mean, um, I assume this, the uh, America's Mart had both um, consumers as well as buyers for supermarkets or mom and pop shops as well. People just looking to uh, sell your products for you. You mean like a, a distribution company or something? No, I was, um, I don't know. For example, the, um, what do you guys have down there that's popular? Kroger's or, um, or a, a Fresh Mart or just your, your mom and pop shops. Uh, I know George is very popular with the, off the highways, they have the little um, farm markets as for lack of a better yeah. term. It was, it, it was a, it was a large cross section of all that kind of stuff. Like for example, we didn't see Kroger, but we saw Knott's Berry Farm from California. Um, we saw lots of um, gift shops in touristy areas like Gatlinburg, uh, Nashville, um, you know, Florida, things like that. Um, trying to think it, it was, it was, it was interesting. I mean, cause you'd also have people coming by, of course, just wanting to do a cash and carry cause they're just there for a different reason. And they just come and by looking at all the food that's available. But, um, you know, we're, we're also excited about potentially doing the, uh, the fancy food show in New York, um, either that one or San Francisco, because that one being an entire show that's focused on food, I believe the audience there will be even better. Um, even though we enjoy the America's Mart, I think it'll be even, uh, more productive for us. So, Tommy, you mentioned being in a variety of states. And for other entrepreneurs, I mean, do you have any advice as to how they expand their product into other states and how they get seen? I mean, how did you guys do it? I started reaching out to people out of state uh, on my own and had not a lot of success. I think a lot of that just comes down to you know, the in-person meeting and the sampling of the product uh, makes a big difference. We started working with a sales agent for a while. Um, that didn't really turn into a whole lot either. Um, I think for us to really get outside our, our borders of the state of Georgia, the America's Mart, you know, being, being in an environment where people are coming to, they, they're looking for product for their store. You know, that's, that's a much more, um, win-win for you and them than to knock on their door on a busy day when they don't, may not be in the mood to hear your pitch. <laughs> Makes and, sense. Yeah. Cold calling is not my favorite thing to do. Um, sometimes a store you'll see it and you, and you just know this is, this is a win. I mean, th they have to carry this sauce, you know, kind of a thing. Um, and then a store that you might, that might work close to home, you see something similar to that out of state and they just don't get it, you know? So it's tough. I mean, a little bit. I, I think I think those kind of stories are different for everybody. I, I think you know, for example, on the trade show floor, sometimes things were really hot for us, and then the last day, for example, the guy who had some honey products that didn't get a ton of traction the day before, he got all the business, like on the last day. <laughs> you know, right. I, there was no rhyme or reason to it. So, uh, you know, but so it's similarly, you know, when you're knocking on doors, uh, it's I think it's similar. It's like it's a little hit and miss. And so I think everybody just has to, to kind of figure out their, their best pitch, you know, that elevator pitch, the easy, quick way to, to tell your story. And, and hopefully you get a chance to, what I, what I do when I drop off a bottle somewhere and I, and they're busy and I don't really have time, I, I leave it and I tell them, I want them to test drive it, you know, kind of like a car, you know, so here, I want to leave this with you guys to test drive this bottle. Uh, I'll, I'll be back in touch with you and see if you guys might want to carry it, you know, that kind of thing. 
Um, so how did you find your co-packer? Packer, and um, I know we had talked before and you said they were in California, I believe, but how did you go yep. about that? I mean, there's not a lot of companies out there that actually co-package hot sauce that I know of, but maybe there are. Well, the, the co-packer in California is our jerky co-packer. Um, starting with the hot sauce, I just searched you know, through Google in our area, Metro Atlanta, and found two or three that were possibilities. And of course, when you're looking at doing this, you also have the route of going with a shared kitchen and being the manufacturer yourself. And so we had to weigh the time, you know, there, the time and the money, what, what, where, you know, what was the best balance for us right now between time and money to make it ourselves and to become a manufacturer and to, and to do the contract with a shared kitchen, which was a monthly expense, like overhead, or to call a co-packer and say, I need another 500 bottles, you know, and then just pick them up in a week or two. And so for us, it has been that the co-packer is the right way to go for us right now. In finding that person, uh, we just made calls and, you know, we had found one company to be really short on the phone. And like, I was like, well, I want to pop by, you know, this week and talk to you guys. And, and they're really short, like, you know what, we're busy, you know? And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to go to him. <laughs> Next. <laughs> I, I want someone that will sit down with me and, and get it. You know, you can't, they can only be so excited about your sauce unless you're buying a million units, then they'd be really excited. But, you know, you want them to at least hear you, you know? And so we found our co-packer shared kitchens, uh, uh, actually shared kitchens, um, no longer co-packs, but a woman that worked there started screen door foods and they're our co-packer now. So Janet at screen door foods, hopefully it's okay for, I give her a little promo. Yep, there. You can give any plugs uh, you want and we'll add them to the episode notes. I didn't mean yeah. to interrupt there, but go on. No, that's all right. Um, she and I got on the phone one time and she was like, why don't you come down here and talk to me? So I went down there and we talked and, uh, they were consolidating from having two kitchens to one. So it was a busy time for her and I was just getting started. So uh, it was just sitting down, you know, face to face with her ha after going through two or three. You know, like I said, one of them I passed on because they were short with me. Another one I passed on because they were really expensive. Like just right out of the gate, you could tell you know, it, they just wanted to add on fees, you know, for things, you know. So I went and sat down with Janet and we talked about our hurdles and the things that we had not been able to get over. And she instantly recognized, she's like, you need to do this and need to do that to do this. And if those two things work, we're, we're 95% there. So that's where we got to and with finding her and, and she's been great. Yeah. I'll make sure that I send you an email cause I want to make sure I include her in the, the episode notes as well, since you've mentioned her and uh, now, make sure we get a, her a plug as well and i think yeah. you said her name was janet at screen door uh screen kitchen a oh, screen, screen door, door foods food. okay and and to touch on this a little further um we wanted to find a, a jerky co-packer in georgia just because shipping and, and also just to kind of keep it all in the family if we could and we couldn't find a, a company in georgia to do it for us um one company tried uh, but they do a rub based jerky and we do a marinade and just their system didn't work for us so we initially went to a company in Nevada and after the test batches, we thought we, we were there, we had it right. And then the full batch came to us and it was, there was just, it was as if it, it wasn't marinated. So in that case, it just didn't work out and we're not really sure. Uh, they didn't really seem to have an explanation for it, but long story short, we found a new company in California. We love the process that they told us they were going to do. And it really, has worked out to be um, a great product. Uh, people are really excited about it. We're excited about the jerky because, you know, hot sauce can sit on a table for a year. Jerky, people usually eat it in an hour or a day. So, you know, more turnover there and things for people to get excited about. Um, but in those two cases, you know, we have two different co-packers right now for, for two different products, two different reasons. Um, but for example, we're going to, we're going to do a new saw, uh, a new, not a new sauce, a new product that is a salt that's infused with our hot sauce. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, gonna be co-packed here by Janet because that's something that's, all that is is mixing it up and letting it, you know, drying it out in the oven, all the things that you do to, to then put it in the shaker and you're ready to go. So with three different products, are you gonna be having separate marketing plans or do you feel like they all complement each other and so you can market them all together? We've been talking about that because Bootlicker um, is our brand. I really want to, you know, promote our brand 
not necessarily always connected to the word hot sauce. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, uh, I think the bootlicker vibe is does have a little bit of a niche. It's this kind of rugged Western, you know, doesn't always have to have alcohol connected to it, but so far it does. Um, <laughs> and but my wife has some baking mixes that we're looking at doing. And so that would not necessarily be called, we don't think it right now that it would be like bootlicker baking mixes, you know, even though that's got a little bit of a ring to it. I don't know that that fits. And we've got these three Mexican products, a tomatillo, a salsa, and a chimichurri that we're wanting to resurrect from a uh, Mexican restaurant that went out of business. The best sauces like that we've, we've ever had. So we're wanting to bring them back, you know, so that people can enjoy them. And those will not be bootlicker labeled. They will be a different, <clears throat> you know, identity, just like Coke has Sprite and Dasani, et cetera. Um, bootlicker is our Coke, I guess you'd say. Uh, there will be, you know, bootlicker products, but then it looks, it's looking like there's going to be sort of some division uh, under that uh, in the family. So do I hear you're becoming a cereal food entrepreneur and taking on various brands? Well, cereal entrepreneur is something I've been accused of regardless of the industry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, I guess, like I said, when I was in the rental industry, that's what I grew up in. We, we rented lawnmowers, chainsaws, tractors, and all that. And it's like, if I was going to stay in that industry, I wanted to be um, a mover and a shaker. You know, it's like, it wasn't about ego. It was about, it was about succeeding in my industry. And when I got out of that industry, when the things started shifting and, and getting consolidated, um, you know, I went into the recording industry and, and media production, video production, et cetera. And so sort of accidentally getting into the food business, as I looked into the future, I'm like, well, just knowing who I am, I don't see just making a, so a single sauce and, and spending the time that it would take to market that just for that single sauce. I think that, you know, my vision, the way I work, it's it's just going to naturally grow. So it has. And so what I've looked at is, you know, the thing with my wife and the baking mix is that's just more like she's really good at that. So it's like maybe we can integrate that somehow. And the Mexican products, it's like that was a good friend of mine, his restaurant, uh, you know, closed down, but it was the best stuff. And I really and he and I both want to see that brought back to life. So. I guess I'm just looking for angles. Like, uh, you know, the friend of mine said, Hey, I've got a certain kind of salsa that might be good in the future. I'm like, well, we'll put that on the back burner, you know, <laughs> kind of on the, the maybe list because we've got lots of ideas right now. But I, I, I think it just, it's for me as an entrepreneur, as a vision, you know, kind of guy, big picture guy, it just kind of comes natural to figure out where to go from here and not just, you know, sort of sit comfortably on one or two things. So as you look into the future, do you imagine growing these companies and maybe trying to sell them so you can keep creating new ones? Or do you imagine just continually having more and more businesses that you run and operate? I told my son, if, if we grow bootlicker into um, a recognized brand, whether it's, whether it's huge or it's still kind of that craft level like it is right now, you know, it's the kind of thing that we can be proud of, uh, that we that we developed this brand and that we created these products and that people enjoy it. Um, it is not my, I'm not sitting here like counting the days till I can sell it. Um, if that arose, you know, one day, yeah, you know, I think we crossed that bridge and we get to it. It's got to be the right deal. You know, my wife and I both, we've talked about that, just not so much that we're looking for it, but just, you know, what would it take? And sometimes it's because you get frustrated, you know, with something and you're like, well, what would it take for somebody to buy this for me right now? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know this, whatever, because the, the, the battle to get the jerky made, it was a year long process and it shouldn't have taken that long. So that was a fight, you know, that was just frustrating. We, we did a Kickstarter where people were anxiously waiting on us to deliver and, and the first batch didn't work out. So you get frustrated. And so then, yeah, you get like, well, maybe I don't want to do this. But um, when it all comes down, um, it, it's something I'm proud of. I think that, that you know, like I, like I was saying, I told my son, you know, to wear the bootlicker T-shirt, the bootlicker hat, go out and do a festival, have fun with it, see people enjoying it. That's something that we can that we can enjoy ourselves. And uh, so we're we're not you know anxiously waiting a sale. 
you know, cross that bridge if it comes. I think there are a lot of food entrepreneurs out there that try to build their businesses for the future generations, uh, for sure. Um, but that being said, how has your family um, been involved in this and, and how do they participate in, in, in your endeavors in food? Um, and how do you see them participating moving forward? Well, they've all been very uh, supportive. Uh, as far as my kids go, you know, sometimes they get roped into helping dad at an outdoor festival. My son worked with me one day at the America's Mart. I did a couple of days myself. My wife did a couple of days and my son helped me a day. Um, he's a good looking guy. So, uh, you know, that helps. He and my wife both were eye candy for the booth. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, so sometimes they, uh, you know, they, they might have to sacrifice dad on a Saturday if it's, you know, some, but there hasn't been a lot of that, you know, it hasn't been that cliche. I'm so busy. I'm missing out on my family. They've been, they've been really involved. You know, they, they enjoy going out with me and, and wearing the brand and, and, uh, working a booth and, and going and getting, they get to run around the, the, the festival and eat food while I'm stuck in the booth, you know, yeah. uh, there's nothing like free child labor when they're your children. Exactly. Um, but no, I mean, they, they've been very supportive and excited, uh, to see it grow. Um, I have a friend, the same friend I mentioned is a big fan of the hot sauce. Uh, because of all that I've done entrepreneurially, um, he told me one day, he said, if I'd done everything you did, my wife would have left me by now. <laughs> and, and, and we're just talking about business. We're not talking about anything weird. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but what he meant was, and he was basically giving her a, a, a shout out to say, you know, you really stuck by him when he did some crazy stuff. So, uh, my wife has been a trooper. Uh, her name's Stephanie and she's, uh, just, she's been a, a rock and a cornerstone through everything I've ever tried. And she's days that I've been frustrated, maybe with bootlicker for one reason or another, she's the one that quietly sat there going, but this is real, you know, I'm not going to say anything right now, but you know, this, this can work. Yet, uh, being with a, an entrepreneur can be difficult at times. I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience that can relate is, uh, if that one doesn't work, there's failures here and there, but it's never, never stopping to, to look at them. It's always trying to grow from them and, and figure out what the next move is. So, yeah. and, and even in the successes, the many entrepreneurs are always looking for, as you said, a baking product or a salsa, if they're in food or, or what the next thing is that they can expand on. So. I, I know it takes toll on families, uh, and um, but I, I also know that it also bonds them. Um, and families being involved, it becomes the times they talk about. Um, hardships are, are what bonds us, not, not the good times often. Yeah. So if you had to go back to the beginning of when you started Boot Liquor, um, what are the lessons now you've learned that you'd wish you would have known at the very beginning? Huh. Um, I don't know. I guess maybe just don't try to move too fast. Do your homework. Um, learn what you don't know, you know. Um, I think, you know, one thing with the different industries I've been in, you, you need to surround yourself, whether they're paid people or, or consultants or whatever, with the people that, you know, um, strengthen your weakness and uh, help help get you farther down the path uh, with the minimal uh, hiccups and uh, mistakes. So that being said, um, what are some of the failures you've seen and the lessons you've learned from them? Um, you know, I've had a, when it comes to bootlicker, we haven't seen any say huge, like let down moments. I mean, the jerky thing was the biggest let down to, to spend all this time and energy, you know, working on the test batches and then to get these big, you know, boxes delivered to our porch and it just not taste right that first round through the initial co-packer. Um, that was a, it was a failure to an extent, not really our fault, but it, it felt like, you know, it, it was a kind of a blow to the gut, you know, you're about to deliver it all. And then you find out I got to start over. I got to find a new co-packer and do all these flavor profile tests again because they're not going to, they'll start with my recipe that I arrived at, but they're, you know, we did, we ended up having to do three more test batches with the new guys, you know? Um, 
trying to think if there's anything else that that was a real setback or um i mean you mentioned the beef jerky and i think that brings up a good point which is a lot of people being entrepreneurs food or not uh find days where they're like i can't believe this is happening or i want to give up and and keep themselves moving forward so how do you motivate yourself and get through those days when you're like i just can't take it or something bad happened or a bad batch comes in um you know even though i might could get a little you know get winded by that punch to the gut um I find it hard to stay down. I'm not a, I'm not a sort of depressed kind of person. So my wife is a very upbeat kind of glass. Uh, I, I, I joke and call it glass half positive as opposed to glass. <laughs> um, and so I think she rubs off on me because I can get down on some things, but I don't stay there. Um, I think that, you know, I track and review my projects daily. I look for the things that I can do today to take it one step further um, look forward to checking those things off the list, uh, you know, forecast what's next, what things excite me, um, you know, and, you know, not to get super spiritual, but I pray for guidance and the right connection, you know, um, and, uh, you know, no, it's, uh, I, I think when you believe in your brand, even though that little thing might be a hiccup and give you a little bit of a downer for a day that whatever that thing is, um, it's hard to, it's hard to stay there. Well, especially when, um, oftentimes you have, uh, customers or people ordering product and, and needing to get it out the door. I guess the, the hardest part of those first couple months or, or a year where sales seem to not go anywhere, but I think there's hope in, uh, in food. It just takes time and no one has an overnight success. Right. And in the middle of, you know, my wife told me, she said the two, the two sauces came per, pretty easily to me, even though I'm not a chef, things like that. And so the battle for the jerky was, was frustrating. And, you know, so she told me, she said, you know, you just have to realize this has been just been a, a real battle to bring this to market. Whereas the other two, they weren't, they weren't hard. Um, in fact, when we got, we actually got the shipment of the, of the good jerky, two days into the trade show, the America's Mart. And I guess the, the shell shock from before I opened the box and I'm trying it and I'm sitting there going, I'm not sure it's right. You know, I'm like, <laughs> so, and, and I was dealing with a little bit of sinus stuff, but I was kind of like, you know, but dinner tasted right. So this should taste right. And I compared it to the test batch and I'm like, I'm not sure the test batch is right. You know, I'm starting to sort of second guess everything. And of course she's like starting to go, Oh no, here we go. <laughs> So what I did is I just, you know what, I slept on it. And this gets to what you're saying about uh, customers, you know, that are, that are there ready to order. Um, I slept on it, tried it again that next morning. I was like, okay, I think maybe it's right. I'm just going to take it to the show and see what people think. And I, and it was right. And, and now that I'm trying it two weeks later, it tastes right. It just, my, it was like something was disconnecting in me, you know, to, from, I guess the first experience, I was afraid, I guess. Um, but being on the trade show floor and having people liking it and I mean, not just liking it, loving it and people wanting to come right up and order, not just for our hot sauce, but for the jerky, you know, that just put you right back on the path, you know, where you might've felt a little bit diverted, like, oh man, am I, should I even be doing this? You know, um, it puts you right back on the road and you're like excited again. <laughs> Uh, tell us more about the beef jerky. Is it only one flavor? And if so, what's the flavor? And do you have plans for adding other flavors? I do. Uh, right now we have the bootlicker original beef jerky, which is based off of our hot sauce. What we did is we took a jerky recipe that we used to make when we would go snow skiing. We haven't been lately, but back when I was in high school and college, I was a big skier and we'd make this jerky at home that was, you know, based on Worcestershire, uh, lemon juice, soy, and I forget what else, black pepper. And so I started with that and I added hot sauce to it, but it wasn't as good as I, as I was hoping it would be. It was like, it was good, but it wasn't great. So I felt like what it needed was a sort of yumminess that would then kick into the jerky flavor that would then move into the hot sauce. So we added brown sugar to it. And so 
what we have is this kind of sweet heat. It starts sweet and it's very tender. Uh, I actually like it after the bag's been left open, not left open, but after it's been open for a day or two where some of the tenderness, you know, starts to dry up a little bit. Um, but anyway, it, so it moves from that sweet to the, to the heat. And, um, and it's, it's almost like Willy Wonka food. It really does transition. <laughs> I love it. From one thing to the other. What kind of um, meat do you use? Oh man, what do they call that? Um, there's, there's a word for it, uh, the cut that they use, and it's escaping me right now. Maybe I'll think of it in a minute. Uh, we looked into grass-fed just to, you know, to try to appeal to all that kind of, you know, uh, marketing, but it was so crazy expensive. We just had to kind of go standard on it to, to start out. But to, uh, and maybe I'll think of the name of that in here in a minute, but the, to answer your other question about other flavors, we have um, two more that we'd like to release this year. One is going to be called um, Rum Runner, which is going to be a rum-based jerky, which is really delicious. And the other one's going to be called Bingo Gringo. Uh, it's a tequila, uh, tequila-based jerky. Um, I won't go into the long story of that, but the Bingo Gringo comes from, uh, and this opens a little bit of a can of worms, but a feature film that I directed uh, that came out back in 09, there is a redneck in a story that yells bingo gringo because he doesn't know that he's the gringo <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, that anyway, can happen sometimes short, short version of that story yeah um so we're we're kind of we're doing little things like that to kind of give homage even it's sort of a private joke kind of thing immersive so we're excited for those two flavors to come out and um you know the the new the new jerky is being really well received. All the Kickstarter people just got their packages this week. We're getting lots of great feedback from them on Facebook and on the Kickstarter site. So you mentioned a rum jerky, and just curious, is I've a couple times made jerky when I was actually in high school with my brother, and I remember cooking it for a very long time on a real low heat. And so does that just burn off all the alcohol? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. Yes. Um, it. Again, it also gets into, you know, you know, portions, like how much of the marinade is actually rum. Um, but, yeah, through the process of the, uh, they, they, they essentially almost like dry age this meat for like 24 hours. Then they marinate it for like 24 hours. And then they dehydrate it. And, and yeah, I don't know, like, like you said, when I was doing it at home, you put on the lowest heat in the oven that you could and it dries it out. Um, similar process to here, except for they actually have, of course, the professional, the racks with the dryers and the tumblers and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's USDA approved, like they're on site. It's all legal and, and good. Can't wait to try it. Yeah, the USDA is a, is a big piece. I think a lot of food, food entrepreneurs don't realize how much it matters when you're dealing with, um, with animal products and the USDA and the inspections and the layers that I have to go people, through now. I'm yeah, sorry, that's why but... people here in Georgia are not, you know, jumping up and down to make jerky for you because, you know, you have to USD, you have to have a USDA inspector on site at your building essentially anytime you're open. Yeah, we deal with a lot of that in our facilities and, you know, it's uh, it's not something that's available 24 hours. So you have to schedule your employees and everything during those times. So it's a, and it's an interesting thing, but for, all the food entrepreneurs on the in the audience, I think it's important to know that the USDA is a big piece of producing food at any large scale for for going into stores or um, the restaurants. It becomes part of what you have to go through and some of the steps you have to take and have that inspector. Right. Um, my next question is: um, How have you? set goals and realize those goals? Is it something that as some entrepreneurs do, they sort of pivot as they go and, and create the goals? Or is there a longer term goal and vision that you have that you're aiming for and, and all the different brands you're trying to create fall under that? Yeah, I think when it comes to setting goals, um, I, I do a lot of the um, initial you know, forecasting and idea you know, slating and all that. And then I get with my wife and talk to her about, you know, this and that. And we just kind of talk about the viability. And of course, the cool thing is recently, she's the one coming to me saying, 
what do you think about making my peach cobbler recipe available? You know, like that kind of stuff. And I'm like, I think it would be awesome because it's the best peach cobbler I've ever had. So, um, you know, I think that just sort of the, um, the desire to put good things out there, you, you, you know, is part of it and, and slating it for what makes sense time frame wise. What can you handle this year? Uh, what, what do you think would be the most exciting? One reason we went ahead and did uh, bootlicker uh, Jack, which is, which is the whiskey version of our sauce, is so many people, we would just mention it at a, at a festival that we were working on that. And it's like they wanted it now, you know? So we knew if we made that one next, that would probably be the best thing for us to do next. So I, I think it's just a matter of balancing, you know, like, like that feedback, um, trying, to, trying to be your own Steve Jobs, you know, to forecast what's coming. Um, I, I use a, an app called Nosebee, which is where I do all my project planning and that kind of thing. So I definitely have it all organized and little task under each one uh, to, and, and, and every year I try to limit, you know, I, I don't take the next 15 things I want to do and put them on my to-do list. I, I say, you know what, I need to take two, maybe, maybe two of these things. Uh, to market and then see what's see see how much of the year is left <laughs> that we're doing anymore. So as it um, we talked a little bit about family as well and and how do those the goals that you set for your company fit into all that? Is it you want to grow and and try to spend more time with them? Is it something you feel that um, you mentioned your son and uh, is it something you feel he'll get into the business as he gets older to help you? Ha I mean, how do you see that? And obviously you need to grow a business big enough for you to, um, to do that and, and employ people full time. Yeah. Um, yes. Similarly to how I, um, you know, I, I also have uh, aspirations to continue to work in the film industry uh, he's actually a musician and he's in college for that. So just as, just as to take him for, as an example, um, I have two daughters and, and a son and they have their own vision, uh, their dreams. And I would never want to lock them into that, but they are totally welcome to be a part of that. So it's, that's kind of the way I see it. My dad always told me when, when I grew up in the rental industry, um, if you don't want to do this, we'll, we'll sell it and, you know, you can do, do whatever you, you want to do. And for a long time, I did do that business. Um, so with them, I think, you know, there's always room for their help. Like my daughter, my middle daughter, she helped with social media for a while. She's in school now, so she doesn't have a lot of time for that. But um, there's ways they can, they can help if they want to. And if they were to want to come right out of college and say, you know what, Dad, I want to work, work at Bootlicker until I figure out where I want to go. You know, all those things are, are doable and possible. Um, kind of, you know chasing a rabbit. I don't remember the original question. <laughs> it's, it's okay. I, I think there's, um, there's a lot of that there in entrepreneurial families. I know for me, yeah. um, I grew up in one, a, a horse farm, uh, on my mom's side. And then my dad was in food and then became a food entrepreneur himself. And for me, I was like, I will never work on a farm or I will never get into food. And, and I swore it off just cause they'd been my boss my whole life. And, um, yeah. But, you know, between jobs, I ended up in food and it, and it sort of sticks and you don't realize how much information and knowledge you pick up from your parents when they are entrepreneurs. I know Deborah's parents were both entrepreneurs as well. And yeah. um, so there's a lot of giving to the next generation and education. And I feel like mentoring that naturally happens that a lot of people don't get. And um, and if people are interested in entrepreneurism or they feel their kids are interested in entrepreneurism. I feel it's necessary that they work with someone who's an entrepreneur already or in the food business yeah. and is an entrepreneur because most of the lessons come so naturally. I mean, I have a master's degree, but I, I still to this day think I learned more being in, in the business and, and hands-on than I ever paid for it in any of my education. Well, I, I tell people always be a student. You know, just never stop learning. And I, I think what you're saying, too, is, is correct. I mean, I grew up with my dad being an entrepreneur. He not only owned his, the, the business, the rental store business, but he developed products for v, aftermarket products for VW Bugs back when nobody was doing that. Um, 
So I get all that kind of stuff really honest, but similarly to what you're saying, I worked alongside him and learned his way even before I worked with him, you know, just growing up with him or growing up, you know, in his house. Um, I saw all that in play and I tell my kids, you know, whatever you do, own it, you know, like, like at first my daughter considered getting into cosmetic chemistry and I kept encouraging her, well, if you work at you know, here or there, you know, at, at some point, that's great. But all along, be figuring out how you can own that destiny too. you know, figure out how you can create your own line or whatever it might be, or your own boutique, et cetera. Uh, that's the kind of thing I try to instill in them, regardless of whether they stick around bootlicker or do their own thing or, or whatever. But um, our family's pretty tight. We we all enjoy a lot of the same stuff, and we we like building things and enjoying trips together. It's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I think that um, you know a couple of the lessons that we've learned from this episode alone is, you know, the one I think is most important is that one is as an entrepreneur, one of the things we chase is being in charge of our own destiny, where someone can't fire us or can't do whatever. It's really the work and the grit we put in determines our path in life and um and our relationships and the relationships we build never get taken away from us we we unless we mess them up but we have the opportunity to really get out there and, and our success or failure are really based on our own um endeavors and whether we learn or not and things like that the second part is is n- being down or, or getting knocked down or having a failure, it's not something to dwell on. I think you, sh- you shared that you're pretty upbeat and your wife's pretty upbeat and you're always looking for the next thing. I think that's another important takeaway. And the last takeaway I think is how people um, need to just take the first step. I, I hear that you have a lot of ideas, but for you, you know, it's just always taking a step. People get fearful when they don't take that first step and and never actually move forward with anything petrified by fear and so if you have an idea all you can do is move forward the more you wait to bring it forth the longer it's going to take you to ever get it off the ground and I think that happened to you with the bootlicker sauce it was an idea and people liked it and it was a matter of just taking that first step forward Um, would you agree with those three things for sure and it would have been easy for me uh, I guess you'd say easy to just keep making it for friends and, and feel like, you know what, I don't even know if this will, if this would fly. This is just, you know, this is just a pipe dream or whatever. But when you keep having people come to you and say, why don't you bring it to market? You realize it's not just you, you know, so it was worth taking that first step. Um, you know, it, it's, you just, you got to believe in it and don't give up. Yeah, and there's probably a fourth lesson there, which is if you you have something, get it into as many people's hands or mouth as as mm-hmm. possible, um, and um, and have them test it because the feedback early on and getting people to try it and and giving it away and gives people loyalty to your product, and it also gives you honest feedback. I think that there in and of itself being in food people will give you feedback if you give it to them for free and and you ask for honest feedback and if you find success then um that success is obviously a good product and gives you a good indicator to take that product to market Um, i think one thing that i saw on the trade show floor which i'd seen before but on the trade show floor it's in abundance and that is that there are a lot of people making chocolate there's a lot of people making honey Maybe not as many people on that trade show floor making hot sauce, but a few people, mostly barbecue sauce in that case. But I bring that up because, you know, you do need an angle. You know, what sets you apart? What makes you uh, worth putting on the shelf over another product? And it's not to belittle their products, but what makes you unique? And and that's what we, we felt like we had, you know, from the start. Yeah, I think that's a, an important thing is how do you differentiate yourself from everyone else in the market in food? Because there are a lot of restaurants and, and food businesses in various categories, but how do you differentiate yourself? I think it's key, and, and it's more than just the taste of your food. It, it's also how you market it and the idea and the name you come up with and 
and you and the and the person that's the food entrepreneur and how much work are, are you willing to put in to, to go out there and push your product and how much are you willing to listen to other people and you know a lot of it also what I found is that helping others encourages them to help you and in food everyone's in it and so if helping each other really goes a long way and, and people tend to help each other really at those early stages and I think that's important as well as trying to learn from each other. Everyone in the Georgia Grown booth was very supportive of each other. Um, you know, there was no kind of weird, like, you know, oh, they have a product similar to mine, so I'm not going to talk to them or anything like that. Everyone was very supportive. And you talked about um, not, it's not just the food, the flavor itself, but how you present it uh, at the trade show. It was not the first time, but we saw even in greater numbers, people coming up saying, I love the way this looks. I love this name. You know, it just, it's unique enough to make them just notice it just on curb appeal alone. Yeah. I love your product. I, I, I like the, the marketing. I like the, the taste. I like the flavor. Um, I'm, next time we're in Georgia, I'm planning on getting some more. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, I think, what we'll do is I'll make sure I, um, I get all the info from you um, on the people you've mentioned um, yeah. on the episode. I will also make sure I have your web address and all of your social media contact information. But if you want to quick give it again, we can do that as we start to wrap up the episode. Yes. So our handle on Instagram and Twitter is bootlicker. That's B-O-O-T-L-I-K-K-E-R. Our website is bootlicker.com, spelled the same way. Uh, I believe Facebook is probably slash bootlicker as well. <laughs> and, you know, we'll, we'll definitely want you to come back on the show in, in a few months and see how everything's coming along and, and give an update right. on all of that. Because I think with the expansion of the beef jerkies and, and the salt we talked about, as well as maybe even the salsas and, and those items and the baking products, it sounds like you're going to be moving forward. And I want to make sure we give our audience sort of, you know, milestones as you go along. So they follow your story as well, because I think it's important. I think you have a great story and, and how you're expanding your product line and just as an entrepreneur. So I hope you'll be on again for sure. Yeah. It sounds like fun. And, um, and, and for the audience, uh, again, this is Justin, the food entrepreneurs. You can reach me at justin.bizarro at gmail. That's B I double Z A double R O at gmail.com. If you're interested on in being on the show or you're interested in having your questions asked for the entrepreneurs that are on the show, please email me, or you can also direct message me on Instagram at Justin and the food entrepreneurs. Uh, thank you again, Tommy. I really appreciate your time. And, and Deborah, thank you for co-hosting. And uh, I appreciate it again. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.